You're listening to Season 4, Episode Number 1 of the Indie Artist Tribe Podcast with me, your host, Angela Matamocha. Welcome. Hi there, good people. Hi, hi, hi. Angela Matamocha here of Indie Artist Tribe. Thank you so much for being with me. Today, I have multiple award-winning playwright, actor, and director. He is an NAACP Theater Award nominee for Best Playwright. He is an Ovation Award nominee for Best New Play. He's also a critic's pick for both LA Times and LA Weekly. Film and television projects include The Last Revolutionary, The Guest, The Bow Wow Club, The Stuttering Preacher. As an actor, he has performed on Broadway, off Broadway, at regional theaters, and even in the Caribbean. But the most, my most favorite thing about him is that he is an art of, artist and activist that's always seeking to create work that entertains while inspiring and motivating change. Good people, I bring to you Levi Lee. Levy Lee, welcome. Hey, <laughs> how are you? <laughs> I am good. Thank you so much for being uh, being here. I'm so excited to have you. Um, I got to say, I don't think I've seen you at, for at least a decade. Yeah. Yeah, because you were in um, part three of the Haitian trilogy, you know, Christophe, and that was in 2004. And what I remember about you in Christoph was you were so fiercely intense. Oh my God, girl. <laughs> oh, I was scared of you. I mean, you were just intense. You, in, that, in that scene when uh, Christoph is, is, um, is, it's kind of like, berating the 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 light-skinned women you, and you just stood up to him like i was like look at her she about to get her head chopped off but she don't know it <laughs> yeah i think i spit on him or something yeah, i was like oh my god <laughs> <laughs> what was so great about that it was just a, another reminder there are no small parts only small actors right True. you made it yours yeah, that you see, I'm talking about it. It was memorable. Wow! It was all these years later, it's memorable. It was memorable. Ah, oh, thank you so much <laughs> for sharing that with me. That's awesome to know. And can I just say that whole experience? Um, and this is the trilogy that he's talking about that he did, uh, directed by uh, Ben Guillory at the Roby Theater Company, was such an incredible experience. And with that piece in particular. How many cast members did we have? Oh, well, the entire trilogy, including that, um, so each play had over 25 actors. Um, and I think uh, Kristoff probably had 28, you know, something like that. Yeah. I've never been in a play with such a huge cast. And it was so cool because I met so many incredible people that I am still in contact with today, all these years later. That was That's such an incredible cool. experience with the music and the dance and the costumes. It was just. <sighs> <laughs> it, it was an incredible experience for me, too. You know, can imagine as a playwright, I never thought those plays would ever get done because of the size of the of the shows uh is epic. epic and and i never thought that any theater company would would do those plays you know i felt that they would maybe end up being published and be in a library somewhere you know used for academic study or something like that but um you know i got a call from ben guillory um out of the blue when I was in Iowa teaching and uh, he had gotten, I, okay, the story is this, is that when. Yes, I, I, I was <laughs> going to say, because I think our audience can learn a lot from this, the way you went about um, getting the 
piece out first. Tell us the story of who you sent so, it to first. Sure. So, you know, I started out as an actor in New York City. Um, and one day, you know, I was up in Harlem, where I'm from, and uh, there was a, a bookstore called the Liberation Bookstore. I went in and uh, and I was browsing around and I uh, I picked up this book called The Black Triumvirate. Didn't know what it was about. It intrigued me, the, the title. And when I opened it up, it was a, a book about the Haitian Revolution, which I was aware of, but didn't know anything about. So I started reading it. And the first page, I could not put it down. And I read that book in like three days. I, I, I literally slept with it and um, woke up with it. And when I was done, I said to myself, wow, this will make a great play or great movie. Not knowing at the time that I would eventually be the one to write it because I wasn't writing at that time. I was, you know, a, an actor. And what I did start writing and, you know, my work had gotten me recognized and I got to the University of Iowa for a grad program. I, you know, I received a, a full fellowship and my advisor said, well, you know, at the end of the three year program, you are going to write your thesis play. And I said to him, I already know what I'm going to write. And he said, well, what's that, Lee? I said, I am going to write a, a, a trilogy about the Haitian Revolution. And he, he his mind was blown. He said, well, that's a, you know, that, that's a heavy task. And yeah. I was like, yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm up for it. Because after I read that one book, which was like at least 10 years before going to grad school, and after I read that one book, I, you know, periodically I would go to the Schomburg Library or I would go downtown to the 42nd Street Main Library in New York City. And I would just sit in there all day doing research, not knowing that I was doing research. I was just so in, in passion about the history that I want I want to read it, you know, and uh, it was better than going to the movies sometimes, you know. And and I would read the, the story about us, about black people and how we liberated ourselves from slavery, you know, through a violent revolution and a story that has never been told on a wide scale. Um, and I was just, wow. And so my mission became to write this play, these plays about three of the greatest, well, three of the greatest men and some of the women that, that were, I think, the greatest men to walk the face of the planet. You know, and yeah, so, so I wrote it and then it was like, okay, then what? And then when I shared it with my, um, my academics and scholars at a university of Iowa, they said, Lee, this is going to get produced. And I thought they were blowing smoke, you know, I was like, yeah, okay. You're being very kind to me, blah, blah, blah. So one day, you know, uh, I am sitting in my office this is 2001 uh like february and uh i was having um office hours with students and the last student just left and i was about to go home and the phone rang and you know that moment is like i looked at that phone and i, was, I didn't want to take a phone call i thought it was another student and I didn't want to engage that. I was tired. I was ready to go home and relax. End of your day. End of my day, you know. And I looked at that phone and I, uh, and so I, I, I picked it up. Fate would have it. And on the other end, there was this voice and this man said, Levy Lee Simon, this is Ben Guillory from the Roby Theater Company. And I said, yeah. And he says, I received your play of the uh for the love of freedom to sant i said yeah he said we would like to do your play do we have permission to do your play and i'm like who are you again <laughs> 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 and, and then he said he said well someone would like to talk to you 
And another voice got on the line. Said, hey, man, love this play, man. This play, we've been looking for a play like this for 7, 11 years, man. And it was Danny Glover. And I'm like, I'm, okay, so who's playing a trick? Danny Glover? I'm talking to Danny Glover right now. You know, and I'm in Iowa, in the middle of the country, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of Lily White, Iowa, you know. And I'm like, I'm like okay, someone's playing a trick. No, no, Lee, look, we really want to do your play, you know. And, and it was Danny Glover and it was Ben Guillory. And I hung up the phone and walked into the lobby of the theater and just let out a scream. <laughs> and everyone came in and well, hell, I was just talking to Danny Glover on the scene and they want to do my play. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, so that's how that's how it all started. What a story. How did he get your play? How did Ben get your play? Okay, so how how he got the play was there was a director um at the University of Iowa uh, in the uh, graduate directing program, Idris Cooper. And she graduated the year before, and she was from San Francisco. And she called me and she said, hey, Lee, you know, Danny Glove is looking for writers for a, a screenplay about Toussaint Nova Shore. <laughs> and at that time, I had not written a screenplay, but I had written the play, and she knew that. And I said, well, you know what? Um, I didn't think about it at first. I just, I, I sent them a query letter actually. And they sent me a letter back saying that they were um, not really interested in a play. They were only interested in a screenplay. So I, I, I sat on that for months. And then one Saturday morning, I, I, I sat up in my bed and was like, oh, I was hit with a, like an epiphany. I said, oh, you know, I should send them the play anyway. Because they need to know that someone has done the research and knows the history and knows the characters and, you know, all of that, know who was involved. So I I, I, pack, I uh, made a package and I sent them the script to Carrie Productions in San Francisco. And, and I forgot about it. You know, I didn't think about it. And, and when Ben called me, it had been like six months since I had sent that. And and um, and that's how he got it. And he he said, look, we you know, we we already have things in place for a movie script, but we want to do your play as a play. And I was not anticipating that because I was sending it with the intention of being put on the map for the screenplay. But they said they wanted to do it as a play. And I'm like, I I'm not. Who am I to say no? Yes, of course. <laughs> I never thought it would ever get done, you know? So that's how it all started. And was that your first foray into theater? Oh, no, 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 no. As, I, a, as a playwright? No, 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 oh. no, no, no. Um, no, I started out as an actor, like I said. Yeah. And, and um, I was with a theater company in New York called Circle, Circle Repertory Theater Company. Yes. Of course. Very reputable company, yeah. very reputable artist as an actor. And um and I was I was kind of dabbing at writing and they had a, a, a they had a thing where they wanted all the artists in the company to work outside of their their discipline. So if you are an actor, they wanted you to direct or write. And if you are a writer, they wanted you to do some acting and producing. Smart. It, you know, and it was it was a beautiful thing, and I was working on uh, a play called "God, the Crack House, and the Devil," and um, I wrote the play, and I, I contacted a, a director friend of mine, Mary Beth Easley, and I said, "Hey, Mary Beth, I wrote a play," and she's because she knew me as an actor, and she said, "Really, you wrote a play?" I said, "Yeah." She said. Well, can I read it? And I said, sure. So I sent it to her. And this is like 93. 
And um, real quick, pause right there. So I'm just so our audience can go on this journey with you. So it's 93. You've written your first play. And back then, I don't know what kind of screenwriting or playwriting software we had. How did you write it? On a yellow legal paper. <laughs> Great question. On yellow legal paper, I wrote I wrote it and I and I sent it. And I and she came by and picked it up. I couldn't send it. We weren't doing the emails then. And I and I and she came by and picked it up. And a few days later she called me and she said, Lee, this is very good. Now, the thing about Mary Beth, she's a a, a top notch New York City theater director I and who whose work is stellar in her own right and I believed her and um and she said well the first thing we're gonna have to do is get it typed up right <laughs> 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 so she called a mutual friend Sandy Dietrich and Sandy was a also a writer but she's also um an executive she was an executive secretary and she typed it up in no time and there it was i had a a, a a written screenplay with my name on it and it was like oh my god you know and um we approached uh circle rep uh head people about having a reading and michael warren powell god rest his soul um said of course you know you of course lee We'll give you a reading and we put And this a, is your first play. My first well, I, I wrote a couple of other plays before. This was the first play that put this is the play that put me on the map as a playwright. Got you. Prior to that, I had written a couple of pieces that were read up at Frank Severs Writers Workshop. And um, you know, I mean, yeah, but I I did I, I did not in any way consider myself a playwright at that time. You know, um, it was something I did. But this play, you know, uh, we had, we had, we casted it in Circle Rep at that time, um, did not have a lot of, of people of color, artists of color. So I had to go outside of the company to cast yes. actors. It had 12 actors in that play, and eight of them are people of color. Right. And so I had to go outside of the company to bring actors in. And um, we did the reading and the reading went so well that they offered us a workshop production. And uh, Tanya Barris then um, came to me and, and said, look, you know, we don't have, you know, uh, a lot of African-American or Latina you know, playwright, I mean, actors. So we're going to invite all the people that are in this show into the company. And they did. And uh, that's wonderful. That, that opened the door and started a trend. And that was great. And then we, we did that workshop production and it was amazing. Um, and it was during that time that, um, Bob, well, she was Barbara Goldman, then she goes by Emma Goldman now. But Barbara Goldman, who was a writer and but she she loved the play and she, you know, we were good friends and she wanted to work on the production. So she was working on the production, doing props or whatever she was doing. And and I came into the green room one night and everyone was kind of giving her a toast because she had gotten accepted to the University of Iowa Playwrights Workshop which I knew nothing about. I'm like, oh, congratulations. You know, what, what, what is this? What's the big deal? And they was telling me that, well, you know, University of Iowa has like one of the best playwriting programs in the country. And, oh, well, that's cool. I said, well, Barbara, good luck to you. You know, watch out for the cows. You know, don't eat too much milk. <laughs> don't drink too much milk, you know. <laughs> and And boom, off she went. A year later, uh, I'm coming back. I was doing a play at um, Cincinnati Playhouse in the Park. I was doing Miss Evers' voice. Oh, wow. And, and we had just finished a, that production. And I was just getting back to New York City. I was living downtown in the East Village. And I was walking into my 
apartment and uh, the phone was ringing. And again, one of those moments. Now, this time I wanted to pick up the phone. I'm just getting home. I got my bags. I'm coming into my apartment. The phone is ringing. I got to get the phone, right? So I get the phone, pick it up, and it's Barbara. And she said, hey, Lee, what's going on? I said, hey, man, I'm just getting back from Cincinnati. And she said, I said, what's up? She said, well, she said, I'm here in Iowa, and I want to tell you that um, they are offering fellowships for playwrights of color. And I'm like, I'm not going to grad school, Barbara. Are you out of your mind? I'm, I'm, I'm an actor. <gasps> what are you talking about? And she was like, well, I gave them your play, God, the Crack House and the Devil, because she had a copy of it. Oh my right? gosh. And she said, I gave them your play, and uh, I told them all about you, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, Barbara, I'm not interested. And actually, the play that I had done in Cincinnati was supposed to be going to uh, London for a production in London, right? And I said, I'm getting a good London. I am not. Yeah, right? That was like uh, December of uh, 95, okay? So when I, when I, well, yeah, and we were supposed to be going to London in 96, like February, March of 96. Well, it fell through. Uh, we weren't going on it anymore. And not only that, Barbara being Barbara, she sent the application anyway. Oh I got gosh. the application in the mail. It's sitting on, on my kitchen table collecting chicken grease. And, <laughs> and I'm like, and then I sort of, you know, side eye looking at this application, you know, because, you know, you, as an actor, uh, how many times do you get these situations where you get your hopes up about a production or a play and then all of a sudden it goes away right and and, and it has happened before and here it was again and now i'm looking at this application but well maybe maybe uh, i don't know maybe right but that's like like i said february you know and and now months have passed it's the summer, it's July of 96. And um, I'm in New York, I mean, it was hot. And my manager uh, called me and asked if I wanted to take a ride to the uh, Eugene O'Neill Playwrights Festival in Connecticut. This is a Friday night. And I said, sure. And so on the ride up there, um, I asked him whose play was being read. And he said, Lee Blessing. Now, Lee Blessing, you know, the famous playwright. Yes. That plays on Broadway and all that, was going to head the playwriting department at the University of Iowa. Oh, wow. Who, who knew, right? So not only that, and this, and this is how things align in my life. I'm sitting there in the theater watching this beautiful play, going to St. Ives with... Uh, had the late great Novella Nelson was in it. It was a two hander, two character play, and and uh, and I'm watching this beautiful play. And intermission, the lights come up, and I'm sitting next to the lighting designer, who was the lighting designer for Miss Evers Boys in Cincinnati. And we're talking, and I say, "Hey, man, I I I really need to meet this Lee Blessing guy." And he said, come with me. He said, I designed this set. He said, come with me. So we go out and Lee is being surrounded by people and he pushes through the crowd and he walks up to Lee and he said, Lee, meet Lee. And Lee, he said, Lee, Levy <laughs> Lee, Levy Lee Simon. And I was like, what? yeah, he says, aren't you supposed to be coming to Iowa? <laughs> oh my God. Uh, uh, and so I still was like, I didn't have an answer, but I, I, I invited him to see a reading of a play that they were doing a reading of Crack House in New York the following week. And he said, look, you know what? I'm, I got to go back to L.A. I, I don't know. And he came to that reading. And then afterwards, he said, look, if you still want to come to the University of Iowa, he said, um, I will do all the paperwork 
on my end. And all you have to do, all you have to do is get there. Wow. And I'm like, okay, uh, yeah, I think I'm hearing like this is mm -hmm. talking, right? You know? And and literally what capped it was um just a few days before I was going to leave New York and go to Iowa, um, I get a call. Um, from um, from the secretary at the University of Iowa. And she says, hey, Lee, I want to let you know that Lee Blessing resigned. Oh. And I'm like, oh, what happened? She, he had some personal stuff, you oh. know. So Alan McVeigh, who was the um, artistic director of the University of Iowa Theater Department, you know, I'm on the phone with him and he said, look, Lee, he says, you know, Lee Blessing spoke so highly of you. He said, we're going to honor right. what he asked right. to be given this fellowship. He right. said, if you don't want to come because he's not here, we understand that, and, you know, we'll move on. He said, but what do you want to do? And I said, I'm coming. I, I'm going. You what know? made you decide? Because I knew that it was in the, it was in the, it was bigger than me. It was in the universe. Yeah. Yeah. I just felt that, you know, and it was time. And and you know, at 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 that very time, I was um, also up to do a, a. Speaking of Danny Glover, this is how things go. I was up to do a, a understudy. Danny was doing um, an author of full guard play. I'm forgetting which one it was. And I uh. It was not simply by it. Uh, I'm forgetting which one he did. It was. It did go to Broadway. Okay, and with Matthew Broderick. Yes, yes, yes. My uncle was in that play, Zakes Mokai. Yes, 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 exactly. Why can't I get the name? <laughs> they they, they want a Tony. That's right. That's right. And Master Harold and the boys. Master Harold and the boys. That's yes. it. Yes. And and the the uh the other actor that was playing the waiter or whatever uh yes. was actor that had been on TV in oh my god he, he he's he's working all the time. But I was up for his understanding. In fact, I was going to get it, right? And wow. and 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 I had to make a decision then do I want to do that? Oh be to study in a Broadway play, or do I want to go to Iowa and work on my playwriting? And I said, you know what? I am going to go to Iowa. And it was probably not probably it was one of one of the best decisions I ever made in my life. You know, to go to do that. Yeah. Talk about just faith and yes. the universe yes. aligning yes. and the path yes. of least resistance. And, yes. Right. Yes. Gosh, I love that. I love how things just sort of fell into place and you, for the most part, were open and just kind of said yes and okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I fought, you know, but no, no lie. You know, if it, if it had been left up to me, I probably from the beginning, but but they keep they kept coming, you know, and, and it was you like had people really that that truly believed in you. And that and that, you know, too, you know, it wasn't just. It wasn't just my decision, you know, and and so uh, I yeah. can only imagine what that kind of support must have done to your confidence, your level of confidence at that time. Yes, yes. I mean, I don't know if I thought about it in the moment, mm. but I surely have thought about it in retrospect. I, I, you know, I can see it clearer in retrospect, you know, in the moment, you, in the moment, you know, you don't really, I mean, for me, I didn't really see it, you know, as clearly. Because so many I writers, felt, writers in particular, whether they're playwrights or screenwriters or even novelists, um, are so maybe insecure is not the right word, but they're not often sure of themselves, you know? Like, how do I know this is a good story? How do I know this is worth telling, you know? So to have the confidence, because I believe that's what it takes to put your work out there, and especially being so new at it as you were, that's 
just incredible. Yeah, but confidence has never been my problem. <laughs> well, there you go. Well, there you go. <laughs> Let's talk about that. Let's dig into that because that is interesting. Confidence has never been your problem. So do you think that just came not, from... Not... Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry, I cut you up. No, 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 you're fine. Um, do, do you think you didn't lack confidence because you just believed in the stories you were trying to tell? Or was it something that happened to you as you were growing up that instilled confidence within you? I think it's something that um, happened as I was growing up. I grew up in Harlem. You know, um, there's a certain way that you have to be growing up in the inner city, in the hood, you know. And I think that, plus I was an athlete. And, okay. and uh, you know, so I had to have confidence in myself, you know, to compete. You know, on a, on a high level, I played football. I ran track. I played. I mean, you know, you name it. I did it, and I did it pretty well. At least competitively, you know. And um, so, you know, you you step out there. You have to have confidence, and that confidence carried over into my um, into my normal personal life. You know, um, I'm not going to say that I don't. I you know, I'm human. And, and and there's I didn't have to deal with insecurities and fear and all that stuff that, you know, most of us have to deal with. Of course, I did, you know, but I think that uh, overall, I kind of like tried to walk, walk through it. Yeah, yeah. Now, I didn't uh, grow up in Harlem, but I definitely uh, spent some time there. I lived there for. Gosh, in my early 20s, where were you in Harlem? What part? Well, I grew up on 115th Street between Manhattan and Morningside up until I was 12. And then from 12 until I left for college at 18, uh, I was in uh, 146 and Lenox Avenue. Okay. Now Gardens. I'm an EG boy. <laughs> oh, wow. I was uh, yeah. just off the, the last stop on the train. I was on 149th and Adam Clayton. Yeah, <clears throat> that you took the three train. The three, yeah, that was the last stop. Three train, the last stop. Yeah. Yep. So yep. That, that takes you to one block over to Seventh Avenue. I was on Lennox Avenue. Yeah. Yeah. In yeah. a so Dunbar. Yeah, come out. Espinal Gardens is right there. Yeah, right. and literally from the rooftop of my building, you could see Yankee Stadium. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Wow. Wow. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Small world. I loved I, I loved living there. God, so let me ask you, what are you most excited about right now? Um, we don't, you know, talked about your past and your beginnings as a playwright. What are you most looking forward to? What are you excited about right now? I'm just excited about the future, mm. you know, about I'm not done. You know, I don't feel like I feel like sometimes like I'm just beginning um, and um you know, I have a memoir coming out because I have lived some life, a little life, you know, that is, um, you know, we have a book launch here in L.A. Uh, December, December 1st. Great. Me at the, um, the Green Bay Court Theater. On, on Fairfax. Fairfax, yes. And that's a Friday night, uh, 7 o'clock for those, anybody that wants to come is you is open to the public um you know it's going to be a great night uh, with some entertainment and i'll be reading from my memoir great. um and uh yeah so it should be a very very fun night. it's it's actually probably the most daunting and scary thing that i've ever done as an artist what inspired you to write a memoir <laughs> my life listen i my 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 sister told me years ago she says honey you just need to like stop everything you're doing and write your life story because your life story is crazy <laughs> <laughs> and and my sister who is an actress and 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 a very good one um you know she She's like, you know, we're thick as thieves and, and she knows me. And um and I, I 
when she said that, I was like, hmm, maybe, maybe, maybe I do. Maybe I do need to write, you know, because I think that it could be um, inspirational um, to a lot of people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. Now, I want to ask you about um, acting. Mm -hmm. Do you still act? I do. You do. Yes. So, and you're also directing. I am a director. I, I, I claim I own that now. Okay. So I saw the last revolutionary and I'm curious, mm -hmm. why did you not direct that? Okay. So the last revolutionary, um, because you were in it. Yes. You wrote it. But I also know you're a director, so I thought, interesting. But I, I'm not necessarily a film director uh -huh. yet, yet. And um, and it all was how that came about. So 2015, I can't believe time has gone by so fast. Oof. You know, um, we were invited to the National Black Theater Festival to do The Last Revolutionary. And while we were down there, um, there was Michael Brewer, who I did not know, oh, wow. uh, approached me. And after he saw the show and he said, I think this would make a great movie. And I was like, yeah, I've been thinking about that. And he said, well, I have all the equipment I have, you know, let's do it. And so we set out to make the movie with him as a director. And uh, we had to raise money, which we did through social media, Indiegogo. You okay. Know. How'd you guys get um, Marla Gibbs? He knew Marla uh, okay. through somebody else. And, and she she was beautiful. She was so, so lovely. I mean, she didn't. Most of her stuff, oddly enough, didn't end up in the movie. And, oh. and, it was, and she got there. Okay, how that happened was she 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 came in late into the situation, and and I'll be honest with you, if I had known that I was going to be writing for Marla Gibbs, I would have altered the script to to suit her talent even more. Right. You know, to make her more of an. I mean, there's room for that in in the in the story. Yes. But it didn't happen, and and you know that was another. That was a lesson learned, you know, when it comes to making movies that, you know, your decision is a final. It's not like, you know, you're in theater and you're going to have another show the next night or you have a long run and you can make changes in the run. You know, it's like once, you know, the camera goes, you know, and you go cut, it's done, you know, it's, it's done. So, but um, I appreciated her. She, you know, she's a obviously a seasoned pro. Yeah. She was lovely to be around. And uh, yeah, and I, Marla, thank you. <laughs> yes, that was just so freaking cool to watch. So you guys did do like an Indiegogo. You did an online fundraising campaign for that film. Actually, we did Kickstarter. And okay. I, I fought for Indiegogo. Because we get like, you know, whatever you earn, you get. You get, but yeah. You have to make a, a declaration. And if you don't get to that goal, you lose all that money. And one of my producers insisted on doing a Kickstarter. And I got tired fighting with her. So I, I, I agreed and I regretted it because there I was, you know, at the 15th hour, man, please, please, you know, please, you know, oh my God, that, that, was the most stressful, so stressful situation that I have ever been in in association with the entertainment business. That was one stressful thing, and I promised myself I would never do it again. But I'm about to do it again. But in <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not gonna do. I'm not gonna do a Kickstarter though. No, no, I will never do Kickstarter. No.
Yeah, no, I understand that. I had that same fear when I was raising uh, money for my first feature, and I didn't do Kickstarter. We did do Indiegogo, and thank God, because we didn't raise all the money. Right. But we raised enough that we could move forward anyway, you know? Right. So you're getting ready to raise money again. Is this for a film? Uh, yeah. Well, there are two, two pro Well, one, one is... Um, we're actually going to be start the process to uh, bring For the Love of Freedom to New York City. Really? And, yes. <gasps> and and um, so I'm I'm in a partnership with uh, New Federal, not New Federal, New Heritage Theater. Okay, uh, so Ben's uh, Ben Guillory's not going to be involved in this. Ben, it, it will hopefully Ben will be involved. Yes. You know, want to bring him in to that. It's going to start out as a series of readings first. Yes. You know, like a Nicholas Nickleby type thing. And um, so we're going to bring Ben in to direct the first play, you know, so he can set the tone for uh, the rest of the plays because we might end up having um, different directors for each show. You know, and, um, and well, yeah, that's the idea, you know, for the readings. And then we'll we'll deal with that. But I think, you know, opening the door in New York, um, we'll be able to raise money for the production because, you know, New York has, you know, it's a melting pot. And you have this huge Caribbean huge Haitian population population. Yes. In New York City. Yep. And, um, yeah, so uh, we want to expose that to the populations in New York City. And I think we'll get a lot of support. That is such great news. I am so happy to hear that you have not left this trilogy, that you want to continue on and expose My it to more people. My dream has always been ha to have it done in New York because of the reasons that I'm saying. Yeah. And so, you know, we have, we have some seed money. It's not going to be enough, so we need to add some money on to it. So we have to raise a little bit more, you know, for um, make it happen successfully in the way we want it to happen. And I think we'll be able to do that. We'll start that campaign probably in January, and um, the, the 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 target is like we do the the reading in June, and so we'll have enough time to get the monies together and and all that. I think now is the time too, you know, for these kinds of plays, you know, gosh, when you first created this, you know, all these decades ago, we didn't have as many uh, black plays up, period, you know, not only in L.A., but even in New York. And I think now, now is the time. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Oh my gosh, that's so exciting. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's so exciting. Wow, wow, wow. What is it that you love most about being a playwright? Uh, what do I love most about being a player? Good question. Um, first of all, let me just say this. Um, I never saw myself as a playwright. I saw myself as an actor, you know, and then I was a, an actor who had written a couple of plays. I always held writers uh, on a high pedestal, you know, and when you talk about some of the great writers, I, I, I and even, even to this day, I don't see myself in the same category with some of my my heroes you know uh, even know, after writing the trilogy and having all these different accolades for your work no no i'm nowhere near like uh you know james baldwin who i love or you know richard wright or you know um, even even august wilson you know it's like i oh. i put myself up there you know i i i'm, I'm still a student in learning, you know, and and so um no. <laughs> you know, um what you know, I think I think the at the end of the day, what I am as an artist is a storyteller, you know, and and I wanna tell stories that haven't been told before, that people may be afraid to tell, maybe that people uh, certain people in our 
population in our community don't want us to know about, you know, and that has played out recently in our, in our, you know, everyday lives, right? You know, and those people down there in Florida and all that, you know, and, and uh, I want to never, you know, hide anything, you know, um, and if I'm the one that has to break the door down and tell those stories, then I'm going to be that person. You know, that's what I want to do as an artist, you know, is to be that storyteller that tells the untold stories. That's who I am. And I'm so glad you are, because honestly, outside like my black history class in university, I had little knowledge about the Haitian revolt, about the slave revolt in Haiti. And what an incredible, inspiring story that we needed to know about. Yeah. It's yeah. For, I guess I won't say playwrights since you don't want to claim that title, but for other artists that are, you know, up and coming, want to put their work out into the world and never really have, what is your first sort of tip that you would give them j j just starting out, whether they're an actor that wants to, you know, make a play or they're a playwright that wants to make their first film, their first foray into something new. What would, I don't know, some advice. Hmm. Well, okay. Well, I, I am a playwright. Don't get me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to say that I'm not a play. I am a playwright. I know you are. But I'm not on that. You know, I don't see myself. I you understand. Know, you, 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 you got it. Right. I understand. So, uh, so I, I own I own being a playwright today. Good. You know, and it's yeah, I do. Um, you know, as far as advice, you know. It's, it's very, it's very hard because, you know, I don't know what calling someone may have or may not have right ah. so, you know i feel like this is a calling it's a calling yes you know and and i you know um for me it's like i don't know if i chose it or it chose me i think it chose me you know otherwise i don't know if i would have been doing this you know what i'm saying I do. and i recognize that it's a calling and i recognize that it's uh uh, you know, I have a, a purpose on this planet to do what I do, and I have a passion to do what I do, you know, um, through all the ups and downs and rounds and abouts, you know, it's just, this is this is who I am, you know, in this lifetime, right? And so, you know, but young artists, you know, I always say, you know, if it's your passion, yeah, go for it. Go for it. You know, if you're going to be a writer, then write. You know, if you're going to act, then act. You know, um, you know, I see so many people like wanting to like, I mean, I know it's a struggle sometimes, you know, because you're like, eh, there are people that I got to pay my bills. I got to do this and I got to do that. And, you know, and all that. Say, yeah, but what, what do you want to do? Who are you? <sighs> you know? Are you are you working for UPS or are you a writer? It's hard, you know. I mean, I know it is. I mean, when when I made a decision, I was working at um, I was working as a, a caseworker for the Bureau of Child Welfare in, in the Bronx, New York, and um, you know, I've been doing you know acting classes and you know, doing readings around town and doing plays here and there and working. And then the opportunity came for me to, like, uh, do a show that was going to take me away from my nine-to-five job. And I had to go. Now, there were people there on that job that looked at me like I was crazy. Are you going to leave your good job to go do what? Some acid? Oh my God, you know, you're crazy. Yeah, but I never wanted there to be that day where I woke up and, you know, and I'm 75 years old and I'm going, man, woulda, coulda, shoulda. What did I do with my life? Woulda, coulda, shoulda. Follow 
what I wanted to do. Mm. How miserable would I be? See, I'm not miserable now. No. You know what I'm saying? I am not. I don't live a miserable life. You know, I am not wealthy man or anything like that, but I'm happy. You know, because I have a purpose. You know? I feel like I know the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask anyway, because I love asking people this. Do you believe that you were put on this planet at this specific time in history for a particular reason, or do you feel your being here is random? <laughs> I, 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 I don't feel it's random. Um, I don't feel that that's how, I don't know what the powers, that, I don't know what anyone's religion or higher power, spiritual, whatever it is for me, it's like, I think there's a, a, a and, and there is an order to it all. You know, that's just my belief. You know, I don't want to really get into like a, a whole heady thing about spirituality because that's on a different subject line. You know, I mean, we, we could do a whole podcast on that by itself, right? You know, because I, I do feel that that at the end of the day, I'm a spiritual person, you know, and and um, I have strong beliefs in what I what I do believe in, you know, and um, for the record, it's not religion, right? You know, um, but it's it is it is God, it is you know, and and yeah. So do I feel that they, I have, you know, a purpose here? Yes. Do I feel that it was? You know, someone, I'll, I'll just put it this way. It's, it's very simple. Very simple. One of my more spiritual friends, older woman, said to me, she said, Lee, you are here by divine appointment only. Whoa. That's it. I love that. Say more. <laughs> I love that. And I think that is one of the reasons that I like to ask artists this question. Um, you're saying, yes, that can definitely be a podcast all on its own. But I think they're intertwined, you know? Of artists course. And, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I'm, just, I'm just opening it up and saying that, yes, I mean, you can't talk to me without talking about it. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. It, that's part of who I am. Yes. And that's, that's without, without a doubt. You know, but I also just saying that, saying that I could like spend two hours talking with yes. you about that alone. Absolutely. I, you know, just that I could, t I could talk to you about that. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. You are just such a light and such an inspiration. Um, I just want to acknowledge you for the incredible work that you have done for the incredible work that you continue to do and seriously for taking the time out to do all that research. I can't even imagine how much research you had to do for the trilogy. And I know it was a joy for you because you were just swept away by the story and thank God you were because that trilogy, I mean, being in that play was one of the most incredible experiences in my life. So thank you. Thank you, and thank you for being a part of it. Uh, definitely one of the biggest uh, accomplishments in my my personal life and my career. You know, I love doing research. I love, like I said, you know, telling the untold stories and and you know digging deep and finding out the truth of what happened at any particular time. You know, um, same thing happened when. Ben commissioned me to write the Magnificent Dunbar, which was I saw that. Yeah, all about the you know that time period. You know, yes, the, that love that play. Good. And and I, you know, it's like I I did again. It's my purpose. It's what I do. You know, um, yeah, you know, because I didn't I didn't know anything about the whole you know Central Avenue experience with black people in the L.A. during the 1930s and stuff like that, and how rich that whole history is and no one knows about it. 
Yeah. It's so interesting with that play, though it was an L.A. story, when I was living on 149th and Adam Clayton in Harlem, the building that I lived in was called the Dunbar. Mm. And in the 1920s, it was a place for jazz musicians. Everybody hung out in this hotel. Today, it's apartment buildings, but way back in the day in the 20s, it was this groovy, really highly energized and eclectic place where all the artists would hang out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it was East and West, you know, and yeah. um, they copied the, the but they copied the the East Coast actually copied the West Coast. Usually, it's the other way around. It is. I did not know that. Okay, so I didn't know one copied the other. So that was what's so interesting about your play to see that it was the West Coast, and I thought, wow, this is different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and then of course, you know, you had the whole thing, you know, with. Uh, the Dunbar and the Cotton Club, you know, yep. the Cotton Club came first, you know, and, and but the Cotton Club was primarily white owned and in Harlem. And now you have the Dunbar, which is black owned, yes. you know, and, you know, and it became like this place to be in, in and, and it was multicultural, you know, that was, a, you know, it, it was so much there. But, you know, but the thing is, is that, wow, if we don't, Again, if we don't tell our stories, who's going to tell them? They won't get told, right? So, you know, I feel like I have an obligation, you know? I like that. To tell these stories, you know? And, um, you know, I say, you know, acting, acting is my love. Writing is my responsibility. I'm going to steal that. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but really, when you put it in that way, that storytelling writing is an obligation. I think that is such a powerful reminder for me for when I am stuck, when I'm trying to raise money for this project or that project or you hit a wall. It's like, no, this is my obligation to tell the story. That's something that could like you know, empower me to continue on. So thank right. you for that. It's an engine. It drives you. It's you an know? engine. Yeah. It's an engine. If people want to follow you, learn more about you, wh where can I send them? Oh, well, I'm all over the place. So listen, you can find me easily on Facebook, you know, um, Instagram. You put my name in, Levy Lee. You know, uh, on Facebook, Levy Lee Jazz Lion on Instagram. Uh, I am, I don't do the Twitter thing or the whatever, the, the X thing that much because I really don't get it. I don't understand it. Um, but yeah, uh, but all the others, I'm TikTok. You know, I do some TikTok here and there. I'm, 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 <laughs> what you doing on TikTok? <laughs> well, you know, it's, 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 in today's world, <laughs> You know, I got to stay up on things. My my daughter tell me, Dad, you got to stay up on things. You know? <laughs> you know what I mean? You know? So it's like, it, it, if I could use it as a promotional tool, then I'll do that. You know? I, I You know? Um, yeah, TikTok. Uh, yeah, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, of course, LinkedIn. You know, Levy Lee. I'm easy to find. You don't find too many black men, you know, in the world named Levy Lee. You know, so. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your light and your gifts with us today. Um, thank you, Indie Artist Tribe, for hanging out with Levy Lee and I. Until yeah. next time. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>